Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the South Carolina Department of Consumer Affairs' presentation, Security Beyond Passwords. Today, it's my pleasure to join you. I am Carrie Gruby Leibarker, the Administrator and Consumer Advocate here at the Department of Consumer Affairs. Happy to be presenting on such an important topic and then a timely topic as we have received so many security breach notices just in the last couple of months. Um, that affected more than a million South Carolina residents. So we're hopeful that the information that is provided to you today um, will be useful to you and help you to not become a victim of identity theft. We're not really gonna talk about a whole lot of laws. There are some at the end of the presentation, but just wanna give the disclaimer that we're not trying to um, give any kind of substitute for reading the various laws that we may discuss. You can always reach out to our office for guidance or interpretations on those, just trying to give an overview um, and introduction to the topics. All right, so before we go beyond passwords, let's give a couple reminders for passwords. So you wanna make sure that you are creating and using strong passwords for the you know, varied kind of accounts that you may have. Make sure that your password is at least 12 characters long with uppercase and lowercase letters, numbers and symbols. The longer password is the easiest way um, to increase strength. Something that I like to do is, you know, they, they tell you you can think of a song or you can think of a lyric and use the first letter of each word there and enter in some numbers and characters where they fit in. Or a Bible verse, if you're trying to memorize something, you can do that um, with the different characters. You know, if, it's, if there's an A, you use the at symbol. If it's um, if you can put a one or an exclamation point in there somewhere or a four or an and symbol, you know, just trying to mix it up a little bit to make it difficult um, to, for the, for the scammers to be able to guess what words you're trying to say. So you also wanna make sure that you're avoiding using common words or phrases or anything related to your personal life, especially if it can be found via social media. And you can check the strength of your password through a University of Illinois Chicago website. If you enter it in there, it'll let you know how strong it is. And you know, a lot of times now when we're setting up passwords for things, there's even a password strength indicator built in um, there. So just make sure you're paying attention to what those say as well. You wanna make sure that you're keeping your passwords safe. So you don't want to reuse passwords that you have on other accounts, right? So that way, if a hacker gets your password from one account, they can't use it to get into other accounts. You can consider the use of a password manager. Um, this is a good link that kind of goes over pros and cons and tips on choosing a password manager. Because you know we're telling you to make them long, we're telling you to make them complicated to keep them strong, um, but you wanna make sure that you're doing your homework before you choose a password manager. You can do a simple internet search to see what kind of reviews that it has. Talk to friends and family to see what they say. Uh, about the strength or the, the service itself for that password manager, but it's an important tool, right, to have. And if you're putting all of your passwords in one, in one place, then you wanna make sure that it certainly is secure. You wanna also make sure you're picking security questions that only you know the answer to. Again, if there's something that could be easily known, whether it's through public records, like your address, zip code, a birthplace, your mother's maiden name, things like that, or if it's something that somebody could go online to your social media accounts um, and find out, you wanna make sure that you're not using those. I mean, you can even use false answers for the security questions that can make guessing uh, more difficult. You just have to remember what it is that you put down. And then make sure you're changing passwords quickly if there's a breach. You know, and they also say, make sure you change them often, right? So we have some accounts that require you to change them every 90 days, some are 120 days. Some don't have a time frame at all. So you may want to put your own ticker in your phone or on your calendar as a reminder to change them out. And then of course, if there is a security breach where a hacker could have gotten your email information or a password or account information and a password, change that as soon as you get that notice. So Google also has um, a setting or I guess a tool you could say within the settings for passwords. So we don't recommend that you ask your browser to save your password, but if you have it on there, it does have a tool that lets you know 
whether or not a password has been compromised in a breach. And that's just, you know, the, the ability that they have to see online and the dark web um, about whether or not your information was found in the data breach. And so you can change that password there as well. All right, so now that we've talked about passwords, we are going to look at security measures that we um, can take advantage of beyond passwords. So the biggie is multi-factor authentication. So two-factor authentication is the new standard for keeping your account safe and secure. It's considered the best line of defense against hackers who are trying to, to steal your information. So we certainly recommend using it. So when you sign up for two-factor authentication, they will either give you a passcode to get in via an app or security key, or they might scan, you know, fingerprint, something on your face of that nature. Item number one is the most popular item that we see for accounts, especially for um, financial accounts. And so these are the different kinds. So there's a knowledge factor, a possession factor, an inheritance factor. Um, so a lot of times they'll ask you, you know, they'll email you a code that then you have to email or that you have to enter in before you can access um, the site. You know, you put in your username, you put in your password, and then it asks you for this verification code. Sometimes they'll text it to you and you can pick um, whichever phone number you want it to be texted to. Those are the most popular ones we're seeing right now. So how do you enroll in multi-factor authentic authentication? So make sure you're looking at security settings on your most used accounts to see if it is available. If you have a financial account, it is likely available. Banks, credit unions, other financial institutions are using these as a part of their compliance with federal laws um, to make sure that they are keeping your information safe and secure. Social media accounts like Facebook, they have multi-factor authentication too. And we have been getting so many complaints lately about people's Facebook accounts or other social media accounts being hacked. So we wanna make sure that you're aware that the two-factor authentication or this multi-factor authentication is available and that you are using it. And again, this is just a lot of the different kinds of forms of multi-factor authentication. Email accounts, that's a new one um, that popped up. I think in the last year or so, I think our financial institutions were certainly the ones who were getting onto this um, the most quickly. But then online stores to gaming and streaming entertainment services, I mean, it seems to become um, commonplace, thankfully, for the majority of accounts that you may have. If you can't find information for a particular account and whether or not multi-factor authentication is offered, call them. Call them at the number that you know belongs to them. Look on the back of your credit card or your latest statement or um, Google it and you'll probably be able to find out whether or not multi-factor authentication is available and how to take advantage of it. All right, opting out as pre-screened offers. So you may get offers for credit cards, um, people that have looked at your credit report found that you are not a big credit risk, that you use credit wisely, and so they want you to use their products and services too, right? So you can opt out of these pre-screened offers by going to optoutprescreen.com or calling toll-free at 888-5-OPT-OUT. You can also create an account with My Social Security. So this is the official government website that manages your social security benefits. And even if you aren't at the point to where you're getting social um, security checks, it is a good tool to have because you can see where you are monetarily with your social security account and what employers are reporting to um, your to the Social Security Administration as you, because it could be a sign, if you're seeing one you don't recognize, that you could be a victim of identity theft. And so you can check the status of things, future benefits, all that good stuff. But again, the identity theft protection tool is the biggest component um, if you're not getting your checks yet. And so that can be done via ssa.gov slash my account. So similar to pre-screen credit offers, you may be getting calls where folks want you to get their products or services. You can opt out of receiving calls via do not call.gov or toll free at 888-382-1222. And this is the do not call registry that's housed within the Federal Trade Commission. 
It was created in 2003 to stop unwanted sales calls. It's free to register any residential phone number. Again, it's meant for personal numbers. And then after you sign up, there's about a 31 day window that it may take for um, companies to get the updated list. So you may receive calls even after you've signed up. Will you receive calls even after you sign up potentially, uh, even after the 31 days? Yes, and we'll talk about that momentarily. But just to give you an overall idea of what the do not call registry rules are for, what they say, it makes it to where a telemarketer is not allowed to call eight, before 8 a.m. or after 9 p.m. They cannot be deceptive or abusive or lie about terms of their offer. And they cannot ask you to pay with a cash to cash money transfer by giving them a pin from a reloadable debit card or by asking for your bank account information to create a type of check that you'll never see or sign, which is a remotely created payment order. And so this is whether or not you sign up for the do not call registry. Telemarketers in general can't do these items, um, but it's within the same law that creates the registry. Like with any law, there are exemptions. So the registry does not apply to every unwanted call. And that includes from political organizations, charities, debt collectors, informational calls, people taking surveys, and of course, scammers, right? There may be other laws that would apply to the communication. For example, debt collectors have the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act that they have to comply with, which limits the hours that they can contact you and who they can contact. Um, an example of an informational call would be like your cable company calling to let you know of an outage or if a doctor's office or somebody is trying to confirm an upcoming appointment. So the, the point is that the do not call registry does filter out a lot of calls, but it is not going to filter out all of your calls. You can also get your free credit report. Now, we used to say it every year, right? Because under federal law, you have the right to get a credit report from each one of the three credit reporting agencies every 12 months. But ever since COVID, the three, Experian, Equifax, TransUnion, have offered a free credit report every week. I don't know anybody who has taken advantage of it, but we certainly appreciate that extension and would encourage you to do it more often because by looking at your credit report, you can make sure that you're not a victim of identity theft and you can dispute items that don't belong to you before you actually want to buy a product or a service where that credit report's gonna be reviewed and that erroneous item or the, the item that is not, so, you know, could be something that's identity theft related. It could just be a flat out error but those items can affect your credit score and then it'll affect the kind of interest rate or something that you get or whether or not you can get a product or service at all. So we recommend that you put this kind of in your regular rotation of items to make sure that you are um, secure, that you're not a victim of identity theft. And you can get this credit report or these credit reports by the web at annualcreditreport.com. And they are the only federal um, endorsed or the only federal portal for this purpose. There are other portals that are marketed out there, but it will cost you either personal information or money to be able to download your credit report from them. And then if you don't have access to the internet, you can call at 877-322-8228 and they will mail you copies of your credit report. So do this at least once a year. We, we would say, you know, on an anniversary or a birthday or something to where you don't um, we won't forget, but it's important to check for inaccuracies and identity theft. You also have the tool of placing a fraud alert on your credit report. It lasts for one year and alerts businesses that may be viewing your report to take extra steps to verify your identity. So they may ask for an additional um, verification of ID through a utility bill or your car registration or something that matches up with your driver's license. It also entitles you to a free credit report from the three major credit reporting agencies and you only have to call one of the credit reporting agencies to place the alert and they will notify the other ones. There is also an extended fraud alert that applies if you're an identity theft victim that can extend this out for seven years. And there's also a removal from pre-screen credit card offers for that. Under what used to be just state law, but now is federal law as well, you also have the ability to place a security freeze on your credit report. 
It is free to lift or place the freeze, and it is an, a step further than what the fraud alert is. For, for the fraud alert, you can still get the product or service. You just have to provide additional information to the business, right, for that verification. For the freeze, the business is not even going to get access to your credit report because they will get a notice from the credit reporting agency that you have a freeze in place. So it stops anyone from accessing your credit report so that no new lines of credit can be um, given in your name or no product or service where a credit report is part of the check um, to be able to get that will be able to be given to an identity thief, right? Identity thieves can use your information in any way that you can. Th that includes to get health benefits, utilities, you know, a cell phone, a job, things like that. But if you have the freeze in place, if they steal your identity and go to a business to try and get those things, they won't be able to do it if the credit report is a part of the application process. Whenever you want to get new credit or you know, have a transaction where a credit report is gonna be pulled, you can thaw it out pretty easily. They'll have given you a PIN number whenever you place it. You can thaw it out by phone or online, and it happens, I believe, within 15 minutes of you making that request. But with the freeze, you do have to contact each one of the three credit reporting agencies individual, individually to place that freeze. So really the main takeaway from this presentation today with security beyond passwords is that there is no security method that is the silver bullet. It certainly is a combination of items that will help you keep your personal information as secure as possible. So just because you're doing strong passwords, you know, is that component, it doesn't mean that that's the only thing you should be doing. It's the combination. It's the using all of the tools in your toolbox to protect your information. So the more security measures that you're putting into place, the more protected you are going to be. If you do think you've been a victim of identity theft, please call our office. Again, we have an identity theft unit that um, helps folks with one-on-one -on -one guidance on how to remedy your identity theft event. There are different steps that you can take at the state and federal level to try and go through that process. And we have checklists and other basic information um, that will help you. And then we can answer any of your questions along the way.